Good evening. I'm Stuart Brand from the Long Now Foundation. A um, couple of announcements. One is the lights are going to stay up because our speaker, Rosabeth, likes to see what's going on with you and maybe more interactive than some speakers. Uh, also, Rosabeth has a new book, uh, America the Principled, which there's some for sale outside, and she'll stick around for a few minutes in the lobby after the talk to sign some if you want that. Um, nice announcement for Long Now. There's probably a fair number of Long Now members here. How many, actually? I thought so. A great wind went through the auditorium. Um, a long time, fairly quiet, but significant supporter of Long Now has been Pierre Omidyar and his wife Pam. And um, they are so focused on community as the way things should happen in the world that they like very much the way this membership thing is going forward with Long Now and they want to support it. So uh, we're now announcing a matching grant uh, up to $100,000 from Pierre and Pam uh, for to match new memberships. And so people who become a member from now through the end of June, uh, double your money will happen to the foundation. And thank you and thank them. Um, this is coming up on Christmas season. And so people who want to give gift memberships, that I gather is an option. Uh, you members and future members, there's, we had an uh, event for members with Brian Eno a couple months ago. We'll have at least two more events like that uh, be scheduled in the next few months that will be just for you. Years ago, I was hired by Royal Dutch Shell, AT&T, and Volvo the senior people in those three organizations who wanted to think about organizational learning in some new and productive ways. And we had a series of conferences that wound up turning into a thing called Global Business Network that's now 20 years old that I've been working at all that time. I was one of the co-founders. But when I first started looking at organizational learning, there wasn't a hell of a lot of literature on it. But one who was very good, and as I got more and more into the world of business and organizational and governmental consulting, I was a person whose name and whose books kept coming up again and again. And that's Rosabeth Moss Cantor. And that's why she's here tonight. Rosabeth. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you. I'm very honored to be introduced by a legend. So thank you for that. And hello um, to you in, in San Francisco. It's a, always a great pleasure to be here. I believe that my home city of Boston and Cambridge is the only other place in the country um, that has so many visionary thinkers all in one place. Well, I'm here to talk to you about long-term thinking, enduring principles for changing times. And I'm known as a guru of change, but in fact, I really hate change. I think change is a pain in the neck. Change is what other people are making me do. You know, well, that's why we think about change. Whereas, of course, I love being entrepreneurial, creating new projects, that's not exactly change, but change has a bad reputation, and that's one of the reasons that I think we need principles in order to cope with it, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But there's a story. Um, it was actually an all-purpose commencement speech that was written by one of my favorite management philosophers, Woody Allen. I see you've heard of him. And it went something like this. He said, Never before in human history has humanity faced such a crossroads. One path leads to despair and utter hopelessness. The other road leads to total oblivion. Let us pray that we have the wisdom to choose the right one. <laughs> well, you know, I'm glad you laugh because actually 
in the 21st century, this young 21st century, because of what's happened to the national mood, in fact, what's happened to the nation, which is part of what propelled me to write America the Principled, I don't even think that's particularly funny because sometimes that seems like our choice every day. In fact, I defined this as a gross national comedy deficit. When there are too many people who have not long-term thinking, they have very short-term apocalyptic thinking that the world's going to end any minute anyway, and so why bother clean, cleaning up the environment? You know, why put in the effort? Well, change does have a bad reputation, but that's in part why we need enduring principles and values, because that's the only way that we help people make sense of changing times, of the anxiety that we all feel about what's being inflicted on us that appears to make no sense. One of the things that leaders learn is that it's more important to lead through rationale, understanding, principles, why we're doing things than it is to simply issue directives. And so I did write America the Principled in order to provide a coherent, progressive agenda for seizing our future and restoring what I think are American strengths and a country to be proud of with opportunity for all by returning to enduring principles. We need enduring principles. And in fact, in any effort to improve things, to make change, to create a better and brighter future, we always hit roadblocks and obstacles in the middle. In fact, I defined this a long time ago as Cantor's Law. I'm not sure whether anybody else calls it Cantor's Law, but you can help me out. Cantor's Law is that everything can look like a failure in the middle. Anything we start, anything we start that is new and different or is an attempt to make an improvement upon current practice always hits obstacles, roadblocks, objections, resistance to change in the middle. And that's a problem of short-termism. If you don't have a goal, a vision, an underlying principle, and you hit that obstacle in the middle, every entrepreneur in the room knows this, that there were moments when you had the naysayers and the version that didn't work and the problems and the team that defected and the people who were hired away by your competitor. You stop then and by definition it's a failure. But persist, persevere because of having an underlying vision, a set of principles that say there's something that's going to endure and we can make this work, it's often then a success. And so long-term thinking is incredibly important even to the success of new ventures, of new and different things. And so we need enduring principles. We need, we need ways to make sure that we don't panic in the middle of things that aren't quite working, but instead we persist because there's an underlying set of values or an underlying set of principles that we're applying to that effort, whatever it is. In fact, in a, my last book called Confidence, How Winning Streaks and Losing Streaks Begin and End, I found that one of the reasons winning streaks end, that is, success cycles end, is because people panic when something unexpected happens and they immediately drop all the values, all the principles that they stood for. And I feel that that has happened to our country in the 21st century, that a few assaults on America and our sense of ourselves and suddenly many people were willing to abandon principles that we have stood for 
for several centuries that have made this the land of opportunity. And I want to get us back on track. I want to get back to the enduring principles that help us cope with changing times. If we lose sight of those enduring principles, then we're going to be in trouble. We'll panic, just like people panic in the midst of a sports match and suddenly throw out the game plan and can't succeed. And I worry that our country is in that position right now, and we have to get back to the enduring principles that have always made us strong. And there are three that I want to talk to you about, talk with you about tonight, with lots of examples of where I see these in place. The first principle, enduring principle, that helps us cope with changing times is open minds. Open minds. I also happen to think we need some other things to be more open than they are, but we certainly need open minds. A spirit of discovery, human perfectibility. This is what has made the country strong, and this is what will help us cope with changing times. In short, innovation, the mindset of an innovator that's open to discovery, where, where a sense of progress and problem solving is built into everything we do. And I worry that in the last, in the last years of this century, there has been an effort to close minds rather than open it. I, caught, I talk about the kind of thinking that we need for changing times as kaleidoscope thinking. We need to, to see the world the way a kaleidoscope works. When you look through a kaleidoscope, a set of, a set of fragments form a pattern. But all we have to do is twist it, shake it, change angle, change direction, and suddenly the same fragments form an entirely different pattern. It's often not reality that's fixed, it's our view of reality. And often the elements are already here if we're willing to open our minds to new possibilities. Human perfectibility is one of those enduring principles that has always made America strong. We were always the place of discovery, not the place of received wisdom, but the place where minds were open, where we solved problems, where we did things in different ways. And that principle of open minds, of kaleidoscope thinking, has been lost in debates about science versus religion in the United States, for example. It's not really a debate between science and religion. It's orthodoxy versus creativity. And I come down on the end of creativity. That's how we continue to cope with changing times. In Union City, New Jersey, there was an, a, an incredible experiment in changing education dramatically that has made an enormous difference, and it's part of the principle of opening minds to new phenomena. In Union City, New Jersey, one of the failing schools in that community, a visionary mayor, Robert Menendez, who's now a U.S. citizen, a U.S. senator, Robert Menendez, partnered with the school superintendent on the belief that even the poorest urban kids out of poor families in a failing school district could learn and make a difference. And they sought partnerships with leading technology companies to bring the best and the latest to Union City because of a belief that truly no child should be left behind 
even though that legislation is often mythical in its applications. And so in Union City, New Jersey, they started on a journey of discovery, a journey of discovery that would open minds to the possibilities that the children themselves could become the teachers. Now that's an enduring American phenomenon, an enduring American principle. We were said to be the first nation on earth in, w in which the young taught the old. Well, in Union City, by applying new technology and using the school as a test site for the latest that Bell Atlantic, now Verizon, wanted to offer, they not only gained experience with DSL, which is built into the product now, they put the children to work as teachers of their parents and their teachers about the technology and had an enormous gain. So I believe that the innovators of America are there because we open minds to discovery at the youngest ages and must do more of that in order to have a country which continues to move forward. I said the debate is not science versus religion, but orthodoxy versus creativity. Values can constrain or values can enable. You know, I, had, I taught a program at Harvard that had senior executives from the Middle East from nearly every country in the Middle East except Israel because the Israelis couldn't come to that particular round of the program. And the, here was the most striking thing to me about the program in terms of this issue of orthodoxy versus creativity, not science versus religion. I taught a case about Nelson Mandela, the first democratically elected president of South Africa and an incredible role model and a hero of how to bring a country back from the brink of conflict, heal it, and move it forward. Well, I taught the case about Mandela and his philosophies, and we're discussing the case with a set of executives from the Middle East. And I was amazed at a question they asked. Someone said, well, what is Mandela's religion? You don't mention his religion. So I asked the group, I said, why is that important? Well, then we will know how he thinks. We'll, if we know his religion, we will know how he thinks. Because I suddenly realized, to this group of leaders from Middle Eastern countries, with which America supposedly today has a clash of civilizations, which I think is an overstatement of a range of opinions and views that are held in that region. But to them, religion was received wisdom. Religion then told you how to think. And I realized that in the traditions I grew up in, it was a starting point. It wasn't the answer. But to them, they said, if we don't know what his religion is, we won't know how to evaluate his leadership. And I thought, how striking, how different from the principles that have made this country great, which are principles of open minds, of taking received wisdom that has been handed down and doing something to add to it, engage with it, have a dialogue with it. And that is an enduring principle that also produces change. And that's really what we're after in the United States. We are a place where we don't prejudge, we see the particular. Where we, we don't accept received wisdom, we improve upon it. Innovation has always been the thing that has made this country great. And so the enduring principle, even when times change, is that minds are open to learning, that the young can teach the old, that fresh knowledge can combine with wisdom to make a difference. And that principle 
has made this country strong, and I argue that's an enduring principle that will help the rest of the world cope with changing times once we restore respect for the traditions of this country. The second, the second enduring principle for changing times is that activities need to be directed toward a higher purpose, a sense of meaning. In fact, I think we could be, after an age of 30-year age of cynicism, beginning to enter an age of idealism if we shift the political climate in America, that the sense of values or higher purpose as creating meaning in life and meaning in work, meaning in all of our endeavors, even when, even when times are changing, that's what endures, is the values and sense of purpose that we start with. So if innovation is all about change, opening minds to new discoveries, engaging children as well as people of all generations in a quest for the new. We also need a sense of higher purpose. That's an enduring principle, and that's also a principle that has long been part of this country and is increasingly part of the repertoire of a surprising set of institutions. We may be entering an era of a new kind of capitalism, we have the potential to create a values-based capitalism that puts a sense of purpose to make a difference in the world at the center of how businesses operate and how businesses create social enterprises that have a purpose even beyond making money. So let me give you an example of that. IBM, under Sam Palmisano, has become a strikingly different organization in the 21st century. Palmisano inher inherited a company that had been turned around by Lou Gerstner, and it was still among the world's largest technology companies. Depending on which products, Hewlett Packard overtook it, in terms of certain product lines, but it's still one of the world's giants. After it sold off some efforts, IBM was a little smaller. But one of Sam Palmisano's first acts at IBM was to convene a 300,000 per, 300, per, person web chat called a values jam in which every IBMer had an opportunity over a three-day period to discuss values, to discuss what do we stand for and why are we doing this work. Not to talk about technology or strategy, although that came later when they also convened an innovation jam in which over 300,000 people weighed in on what should be the technology priorities of the future. But he started a values jam, a kind of chat um, over a three-day period on the web. Now, IBM had a strong set of values, they thought. They had been laid down out of the head of Tom Watson in an earlier period. But Palmisano did it differently in this open participative process. And in fact, when he mentioned this to the board of directors of IBM, one of the directors who had been CEO of another large company in a fairly conservative industry, said to him, this is socialism. And what Sam Palmisano said back is he said, today we do need values, but they can no longer come from the head of a CEO. That sense, we have sophisticated people all over the world. They're cynical. They speak different languages. They come out of different cultural traditions. Unless they participate in a conversation about what we stand for, what's our higher purpose, nobody's going to buy this, nobody's going to use it. And so they had the web chat, they got all of this input, they distilled it down to a, 
statement of three key values. At the centerpiece of those values is a statement that says, innovation that makes a difference for our customers and the world. And that's all the company needed to begin to, begin to operate in a very different way. Those values are not just on a poster, on paper, or on the web. Those values are invoked all over the world almost every day in meetings at IBM. And when I ask people why do there seem to be so few political disagreements there, they say it's because we have this statement of values. Of course, that tells us exactly what to do. Well, it doesn't tell anybody what to do. It's very grand and general, but it guides activity by independent people. And that sense of higher purpose, of a meaning that transcends my own activity, unites IBM in a way that other organizations are now starting to emulate. And it, it is an enduring principle that we have values and a sense of purpose that also guides people in the work of change. But here's what Palmazano said about why he did this. And it's certainly long-term thinking at its best. He said, management is temporary. Returns are cyclical. But if we use these values as connective tissue, that has longevity. If people can get emotionally connected and have pride in the entity's success, they will do what is important to IBM. Well, defining that sense of purpose so broadly, innovation that makes a difference for the world was a license for people in the United States to work differently when IBM had a new technology. For example, IBM's research labs had made major advances in grid computing where you get the power of supercomputers simply by harnessing unused computing power from desktops, from PCs. And they had made a major advance in this and were wondering how they're going to get this out of, to the marketplace and their customers. And one of the values keepers at IBM immediately got wind of the technology, is in Palmasano's office, creating the model for what they called World Community Grid. They gave away grid computing power first before they started selling it. World Community Grid is a nonprofit established by IBM to get lots of us. I don't know if anybody here has their PC running on World Community Grid. You can volunteer your unused computing power to become part of this network because it is then deployed on some of the world's biggest and most challenging scientific projects that need huge amounts of computing power. And so you can have your computing power donated to projects on HIV AIDS, cancer research, heart disease, where just the number of images require a great deal of computing power in order to do the research. And all over the world, certainly mostly in the US where there's incredible pride in World Community Grid, but all over the world, I've been in executives offices where they point to, they point to the laptop behind their desk and say, oh, today we're processing data for a major cancer research project. Well, they gave it away first in a nonprofit because of the values of the sense of higher purpose. And that's a new kind of capitalism. That's a new way of approaching the world, and we need more of that in America. We need to applaud the people who are doing that. We need to see that being guided by principles and values is, provides more motivation for employees. It helps partners to feel connected to the company. It makes new relationships and it changes the world. So a sense of higher purpose is an enduring principle that helps us change. Because if you have a higher purpose, then you know where innovation should be directed and targeted. 
You don't hang on to orthodoxy. You become creative, but you are reinforcing that value. And we need more of that in America. That's why I think principles are behind how we should run our country as well. And a third enduring principle, and this is particularly an American principle, is common ground. The United States has been said to be the first new nation. By that, political scientists meant that it was the first nation on earth defined not by race or ethnicity or shared history, but defined by the fact that people were occupying the same territory. They were on common ground. In fact, when people first started settling the east coast of the United States, all of the towns were characterized by having a commons in the middle of the town where everybody would come to graze their cattle. Where anybody, with a few exceptions, women couldn't vote and slaves still weren't people, so I can't say that everything about American history was perfect and inclusive, but for the most part, we had a concept of standing on common ground, and that was what united us. And that's a principle that has been such an important part of this country. For all the battles about waves of immigration, in fact, gradually, people started to stand on common ground. Inclusion and then the responsibilities of citizenship have always been part of what this country has stood for. And in fact, in the 1820s, the French aristocrat Alexis de Tocqueville came to the United States and he wrote a famous book called Democracy in America. And he didn't write about our federal government. He didn't write about our big business, what, because we didn't really have much, of course, in his era. But what he wrote about was the ways in which Americans who stood on common ground built community because of voluntary actions by citizens to take responsibility for their own territory, including all that were in that territory. And he said, Americans of all ages, all stations of life, and all types of disposition are forever forming associations. In democratic countries, knowledge of how to combine is the mother of all other forms of knowledge. On its progress depends that of all the others. In towns, it is impossible to prevent people from assembling getting excited together, and forming sudden, passionate resolves. In short, we take responsibility ourselves. President Clinton declared that the era of big government is over to be replaced by the era of big citizens. And that enduring principle of citizen responsibility is an opportunity to infuse our country and the world with a different sensibility. And I have to say, this part of the country, like mine, my home city of Boston, are the models for the nation in terms of social entrepreneurs who form sudden passionate resolves with their fellows and not simply create new businesses, but create new nonprofits that become models for the world, and I think the donation from Pierre Amajar to the Long Now Foundation is a great example of the generosity of Americans. It's generosity that unites us. It's generosity that unites us across partisan divides. People who can't agree on the politics of a situation often agree on the need to help those in need and to create social innovations that are going to produce a better future. It's generosity that can unite us. 
And it's generosity that can change the image of Americans in the world. This is a big problem. And those of you who do anything internationally here, whether it's in business or other realms, know that we must get back to those principles because the view of America and the world is very negative at the moment. In fact, however, there's a big gap between the view of America, the government, versus Americans, the people. There's still much more goodwill around the world to Americans than there is to our country, in part because of a losing streak of a war in Iraq as well as other actions that never didn't really make their countries safer or better, as we see in the situation in Pakistan and its neighbor Afghanistan at the moment. However, we can restore that view of the world if we again return to that enduring principle of common ground through service where responsibility is taken by citizens we can mobilize citizen diplomats who are already involved in projects in Africa, in projects in the Middle East. Because of the generosity of Americans and our penchant to form nonprofits, voluntary associations at the grassroots and do it ourselves, we have an opportunity to do things that the government cannot do and, of course, is not doing. The defense budget is, a, is about 23% of the federal budget. When my research staff and I were counting up how much of the federal budget was spent on programs involving any kind of diplomacy or aid, that came to less than 1 16th of 1% of the entire budget. Well, that gap is being made up by us, the, we the people, through our desire to unite on common ground, to take responsibility at the grassroots all over the world. Because of the Gates Foundation's efforts and contributions as private philanthropy, 22 governments were encouraged to get involved in childhood immunizations. It's often our voluntary actions out of the private sector that galvanize government into doing things. So I think service is sorely needed in the United States, and I'm a gigantic advocate of national service, civilian national service. I'm on the board um, and helped with the founding of a youth service corps. It's active in San Jose. It's a national corps. It was the model for AmeriCorps, President Clinton's national service program. It's called City Year. And young people, 17 to 24, have the opportunity to sign up for a year of full-time service. And when they do that, they're deployed in schools. They're deployed in community organizations. They make a difference in the community but they also become united as a force across diverse aspects of the population. They reach out across partisan divides to various members of the community, and they create a new sense of what the commons, the common ground, can be. The first President Bush had created the Points of Light Foundation, in order to get more volunteerism in America. And I looked at that and said, who could be against it? A thousand points of light? The more lights, the better, I say. But if those lights are not focused like a laser beam on some of our most difficult problems, we will not be the country in the future in changing times that I want us to be. So national service as an effort that we should ask every presidential candidate to endorse. National service is one of those ways that we can take disparate efforts and through full-time cores of young people, full-time cores of retiring baby boomers 
who are part of Experience Corps, which Civic Ventures right here in San Francisco has created, we can create a force that can not only bring about change in the world, but can help us change in America, solve some of our most difficult problems while bringing us together on common ground. And that's the spirit I want in America. And those three principles, open minds, open minds in which we can learn from the young as well as from those who are more senior than we are. A world of discovery, of innovation, in which we don't get bogged down in orthodoxy, which kind of science is allowed to be taught in the schools, for example. A world of higher purpose and higher, higher aspirations in which our businesses are run by values and not by bureaucracy or control systems or putting money first, but rather getting to higher purposes that can make a difference in the world and in which we find common ground. That those kinds of enduring principles can help us cope with some of the most difficult problems we have in America because we have models of how to make each of these things work. And this 21st century that I says have a gross national comedy deficit and where any way we change seems like it's going to bring troubles, like my Woody Allen story, this kind of America has been living through something we know better on the East Coast than you do here, but endless winter. You know, Shakespeare, in one of his tragedies, had a famous line, now is the winter of our discontent. And I feel that we've been in an endless winter of discontent in the 21st century, because winter is a time where we don't open our minds, we close our doors. Winter is a time when we huddle in fear, don't want to go out on the streets, it's too cold, rather than remember the purposes that we stand for. Winter is a time when people retreat, rather than stand on common ground. Well, if this has been the winter of our discontent, then I think we need a shift of seasons. Now, the former governor of California, President Reagan, coasted to the presidency in the 1980s when he said, okay, it's morning in America. And I say, let's make it summer in America, year round. Because the spirit of summer is the spirit that reflects openness and a sense of energy that means that higher purposes can be obtained, and standing on common ground. In summer, people come out from behind closed doors. They go out on the street. They think they can fix their communities. In summer, people go back to nature. We become, we become closer to, the thing, the, to our origins we simplify. In summer, class distinctions tend to be erased because we all dress the same. In summer, we trust strangers. The new commons in America, instead of the places where we grazed cattle in New England centuries ago, the new commons in America might be the public beach. Because on public beaches, there are studies that actually confirm this. People will leave their belongings in the sight of strangers and yet wander off in complete trust. That spirit of summer should be translated into a summer of service for middle school, middle school children to a spirit of optimism, openness, higher purpose, generosity, and common ground. Those enduring principles and the spirit of summer can bring us back to what we've always stood for but had forgotten, which is the land of opportunity, one of the most respected nations on earth, a beacon for democracy, 
the source of innovation, that's where I'd like us to be in the future, and those are enduring principles that even in these troubled, difficult times that sometimes do feel like endless winters until we have a presidential election and maybe shift to summer. That's the America I'd like to see in the future, using open minds, a sense of higher purpose in every endeavor, and standing on common ground. Thank you, and I look forward to dialogue with you. You talked about the national level a lot, and a little bit about institutional level like IBM, and also principles are something that individuals often operate on. What's different, what's the same at those different levels? Uh, um, first of all, I think principle-based management, principle-based leadership, principles that we operate by in our life, what's the same about them is principles are enduring. Principles are a rationale. They tell us why. They come from values. They tell us something about the goal we want to get to. They, are, they endure even as we hit obstacles and roadblocks. They become so important that we don't let them go at every system level. But what's different? I mean, at the national level, at the national level, we often count on leaders to articulate them or not. And we have had leaders that have not particularly stood on principle. First of all, um, they've well, often had, not only have they had ad hoc responses to situations, they have justified actions based not on principles but on fear, seized and consolidated power because they said we know better by withholding information. So at the national level, we're very dependent on leaders because they control institutions that allow us to be free or not. Well, several questions here said, well, George Bush has principles. Um, yeah, we just don't is like the them. problem that they're just different principles? Well, I think they're not these kinds of principles. That's why I articulated several principles. They're not open minds principles because he stood against science time and again, not letting empirical truths, findings, learning, knowledge, open minds to new possibilities, but instead closing minds by saying, I know best, I speak directly to God, um, and there are certain things that we simply will rule out. California has been a pioneer, for example, in saying, well, if the federal government is banning um, stem cell research, we'll do it here. Uh -huh. And by the way, in America the Principled, I point out that the so-called, um, our current um, targeted enemy part of the axis of evil, Iran, which is led by religious fundamentalists, has stem cell research. So that's, a quite, uh, that's an irony. So, so there are some principles that close, and there are principles that open. And so what we have to do is stand for principles or values that open minds, that open possibilities, that include rather than exclude. Well, I can see uh, several of the questions refer to this in regard to Bush, but in regard to various things, which is, uh, Part of how a principle works in the wholesome way you're speaking about is it's pretty deep. It, you know, it's, it's right down there in root. And when a principle is not working out, or a whole lot of people let you know by voting or whatever that they're really not that enchanted with your principle, um, how does principle itself deal with change? Well, first of all, I tried to define three principles that are change-oriented by definition. That is, open minds is a principle that lets you learn new things. Um, higher purpose is a principle that says, I have a responsibility or an obligation to use our technology, the resources of our company, to make sure they're directed towards solving problems that matter for people in the world. And the third principle, common ground, is one that talks about inclusion, 
plus the responsibilities of citizenship. So those are all principles that tend to permit change. Therefore, they're good for changing times. And there are countries in the world that have cultures and have principles that actually close off possibilities. Um, when I was teaching a program at Harvard for um, those Middle Eastern executives, it, and they wanted to know about Mandela's religion, the reason they wanted to know, of course, is because they said, Every, because then we'll know what he's going to do next because it was all given back then. Mm -hmm. So those, that's a principle, and I respect people's faith, but that's a principle that doesn't open you to learning. What else surprised you in that session you did with the Middle Eastern folks? Um, well, several things surprised me. First of all, when I teach my case on Nelson Mandela to Harvard MBAs, um, and you know, Harvard MBAs are a kind of of arrogant bunch, and there's never a, any, any one of my former students here, um, you'll remember. Anyway, so there, when Harvard MBAs um, do case studies, discussions of case studies of the most famous CEOs and political leaders in the world, they've never met a CEO they can't improve on. But Nelson Mandela was, um, held in such high esteem that my MBAs, when I asked them my typical opening question, which is, so, um, are there things he could have done to be more effective? They're silent. When I asked that question to the executives from the Middle East, they immediately had several things to improve upon in Mandela. And the major one was, he was not tough enough on his enemies. And I immediately felt I understood a great deal more of the culture that has led some people to say there's a clash of civilizations. I happen to think that kind of dualistic thinking, you know, you're for us or you're against us, is the wrong kind of thinking for our times. I think actually, and I talk about in the book, the change agent rule of thirds, which is in any situation, yes, there are your allies, there are your opponents, but there's a vast group in the middle that you reach. But, these, but this particular group um, wanted him not to include and forgive and find common ground. They wanted him to be really hard, to retaliate hard on those who had oppressed his people. They wanted revenge. And revenge is not a motive that builds a productive future. You know, revenge might feel good at a particular mm. moment, but it doesn't move you forward in a positive and progressive way. So you're a close student and teacher of Nelson Mandela and the reconciliation process they did in South Africa. Where have you seen that being picked up elsewhere in the world? Um, I don't really see it being picked up often enough, but I do see it being picked up, in essence, in some companies by enlightened chief executives who want to have an open dialogue about what were the mistakes of the past and we're not going to punish anybody for it. Because if you're not able, I suppose we could call this another enduring principle and it has to do with that organizational learning by which you introduced me, but that if you're not able to learn um, from past experience, you can't improve upon it. And if you can't talk about it because you're going to be punished so, so severely, you can't move on either. And so countries get stuck um, on this quest for revenge. And I don't really see, except in smaller institutions, the open dialogue that's required in a non-punitive way to find common ground and move forward. Okay, here's a global question from Kevin Kelly. Um, is what's good for America good for China? Would you expect the same three principles to thrive in China are open minds, higher purpose, and common volunteerism <laughs> universal? I think that's a really great question. And um, the answer is not yet, but very possibly. Um, we keep hearing, you know, countries are, are different, but there are some universal human desires to have voice, even in systems where Things, there's much more respect for hierarchy and elders and 
and tradition, still people like having voice. Um, and I think that as the technology makes it more possible, I think the China we see today could be very different. There already is um, discontent in some of the provinces, among the peasants and so forth, that challenge a central government that tries to have all wisdom. And then um, the businesses in China are increasingly interacting with the world and being influenced by how we do things. And I don't think these are American values. I think they're human values. But I teach executives from China at Harvard. And um, I think if we look for what those commonalities are, and I don't want to keep coming back to the global corporation, except that I think I am um, working right now on, I have an article coming out in Harvard Business Review in January called Transforming Giants. And I think some of these companies like IBM and Procter and & Gamble and a few from other parts of the world, Amron in Japan, Semex in Mexico and so forth, are producing a different model. And they've already had to struggle with the question of universality of values. Um, for example, some rights that we now take for granted in the United States, uh, in this part of the United States, I should say, not quite in the rest of the United States, um, gay and lesbian rights, for example. Well, it's, that's illegal in Egypt. And IBM has had to struggle with how we take this respect for people and their differences and manage to still act on it, even in a country where you can't really talk about it. Can you be specific about that? What, how they do it? Mm -hmm. Well, again, the value, uh, and these aren't just words on paper, but the value of respect and inclusion, to respect who people are and listen to them for their expertise rather than for the package they come in has been taught to people. And there are people are, are in not just training programs, but are encouraged to be mentors, to look after people, to make sure that those values are being acted on. And so while, for example, um, there are huge tensions between Egypt and Israel, political tensions, religious tensions, cultural tensions. Finding common ground on a technical problem has meant that the Cairo Development Lab works with the Haifa Development Lab, and they speak a common language. So by stressing a value, respect, and inclusion, by creating problems that transcend how we're different. That's why I like national service for building common ground. We're not going to have a great dialogue across races, across partisan lines. And, but if we put people together with a task and a deadline, they will begin to work together. And then the third is common language, common vocabulary, common tools. So you're giving people the infrastructure to be able to work together. I mean, this is one of my hopes, by the way, for all the technology that still this is the capital of the world in producing, that it's going to make it easier for us to join because it's also going to preserve the identity and the languages and the culture of very small groups because that can stay alive on the web too. But meanwhile, we have some things that unite us. And um, so as interaction increases between countries, back to the China question, as people have to do business across boundaries, as Chinese enterprises, state-owned or not, realize that they have consumers now, they're not just the government, but they have consumers all over the world who might not like it if they are um, pillagers of the earth in Africa because of how they're extracting the oil, they're not going to like it. That starts changing behavior. A um, couple of questions relating to national service, and I've got some too. One uh, strong one comes from John Gilmore, right here. Why should we do national service when the nation is one of our biggest problems? <laughs> Rather than serving the corrupt government goals, let's serve our communities, our principles, or the whole world. Fantastic way of putting it. You know, I may be so close to the national service movement that the word national doesn't really bother me. Um, 
but we're t civilian national service is really community service. That's where we deploy people. And when I talked about citizen diplomats and philanthropy and generous people, the Oprah Winfrey Leadership School for Girls or Clean Water, which Procter & Gamble has been working on in Africa, um, that's all at the grassroots. And I totally agree. What national, civilian national service really means is community service, which also has that other connotation of you were forced to do it in lieu of prison. So we don't like that connotation. Maybe we need a different word for all of this. But in fact, the proposal, there are proposals on the table now, not only for a summer of service for eighth graders who are too young to work, but have a lot of energy and could do a lot of good, but there are proposals on the table for a whole range of very targeted service corps, like Teach for America writ large, so we have an education corps. We might have a health care corps, which is designed to fill in the gaps, get childhood immunization in every neighborhood, and also help teach the young people or the older people who were there enough about health care that they're better prepared to go on to be professionals in those fields. So there's a, a range of proposals that are targeted, but all of the service is deployed at local levels. And f as far as city year goes, um, that's extremely local in that the model, the funding model, is only 40% of the money comes from the federal government, from AmeriCorps. The rest comes from um, private contributions, and which also brings the private sector into the idea of service and the chance to participate along with the young people. And it comes from mayors and governors who think this is really good for their community. And in fact, in around 2003, when Congress tried to kill national service by reducing the funding dramatically, um, because the Republicans, who were so supposedly all in favor of volunteerism, didn't like the idea, what, you're paying volunteers? Well, they didn't get it that the thousand points of light need the laser beam. So Voices for AmeriCorps was started, and immediately 72 members of the Senate, and this is when the, that was a lot of Republicans too, anybody who had a program in their state really loved it. And practically every governor and lots of mayors all plus lots of private citizens, rose up to say, this is one of the best things we can do. And in fact, if there's one thing that could transform our country quickly, it would be um, to everybody feeling a responsibility and having the opportunity to serve part-time, full-time, over a year, over more years, um, organized in a way that has impact. And we don't really quite have that yet. In fact, after 911, mm -hmm. we lost a tremendous opportunity to call Americans to service. Well, I don't want to say we because I had nothing to do with that administration in Washington. Um, but that opportunity was lost on the part of our leaders who never said, now's our time where we all want to give something to strengthen our country. Imagine if we had a civil defense corps and forget the, that the word defense sounds like the military, civil defense corps that when there's a disaster or an emergency knows exactly what to do in every neighborhood. And that might be part-time and volunteers. We do have that here, community we, emergency response teams yeah. and neighborhood emergency yeah, response teams. Yeah, volunteer, a lot of volunteer people. Well, then San Francisco's a great model. Yeah, my, my wife and I both joined that right after 9-11. That was, you know, our response. But we weren't asked to. That I share most of your opinion on national service. I was lucky enough to, uh, instead of going to graduate school, I did two years in the Army. And it was better graduate school than any I could have taken from my standpoint. And all of us know people. How many Peace Corps people are here by any chance? Thank you for your service. Right. Uh, people who have been yes. in the Peace Corps are the most transformed people I know. Yes. And yet and yet, I was a volunteer in the Army. Um, Peace Corps people are volunteers. They're older ones now as well as young ones, as you know. And in Vietnam, we had a draft army, and it had serious problems. In Iraq, we have a volunteer army, and I can tell you as a uh, close critic of how military behaves, we have a better army because it's volunteer. So how does that map with uh, universal service 
and the question of choice and volunteerism. How do they mix? Right. Well, first of all, I'm not sure I said universal required. Okay. I just want bigger, more, mm -hmm. and that's a good starting point because we have something that works so well and does so much good and is so small in numbers. Even the Peace Corps is a very small number of people, and we need many more people along a continuum of service. Some will be for a summer, some will be for long periods of time, some will become professionals at it and organize it for others, but we, I know that we just need more of it. Whether it becomes a requirement, I think there are other ways that change occurs, and one is that other people are doing it, and therefore young people think this is a really cool and wonderful thing to do. And there are other kinds of incentives which involve things like the kind of training you're going to get because of this. Teach for America right now is a small program, and yet there is Wendy Kopp everywhere. Teach for America may have six or 7,000 in their teacher core now, that's all, given the vast size of public education, and it has so much visibility. But it was, has been the number one recruitment choice on college campuses for major colleges, something like 11% of all graduates of Notre Dame last year applied for Teach for America. I mean, there's an amazing hunger on the part of the population to find these opportunities. And this is different from checkbook charity, although that's good, but that doesn't necessarily build community. We need people actively working too. And we have not provided enough opportunities. So I think we could expand it dramatically without requiring it, and then it becomes the cool thing to do. You know, one of our, uh, let me um, say something on another point I didn't make earlier, because these inner city schools, like the one in Union City, New Jersey, which happened to be 92% Hispanic when they mobilized the kids to learn about technology, and, and now they're wa all wanting to be scientists, and they're going to college. Well. Um, there are many, many places where there's more talent than we're, pot, than, than we're using at all. And this is a way to start getting people out of various places. Right now, in inner city neighborhoods, um, being smart and studying and doing well in school is called acting white. And we have a million school dropouts, high school dropouts in America. I mean, a million is a number that we could even envision a campaign to say, we're going to reduce that um, to a thousand. You know, we'll leave the residual. Um, but we could do something about that. But we don't yet have the means to organize enough people. And it does cost something. So, you know, when the Republicans say, well, I don't want to pay volunteers, I mean, somebody has to help do the organizing. Here's a question, uh, someone speaking to that from Laura Welcher right here. In our rapidly changing high-tech culture, youth teaching us all seems a given. But how do we balance this and raise the marginalized voice of age, wisdom, and experience in our society? Or another way to put it is, will the baby boomers do this for us? Laura is clearly in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> Looking for it from both sides, right. please. Right. I, I think that's... A, a really great question because it does say something about America where we get a little excessive. I mean, Margaret Mead said about America that we were, well, she had a technical word for it. She called it, um, I, well, a, a post-figurative culture. But she said we were um, the only culture she could find in which the young taught the old. In every other culture, Wisdom of experience meant something, but she, she said a lot of that was. She was dismayed about that. She didn't like that. Well, she it thought was, it was bad for continuity. Yeah, and it's a na well, but it also was a given with a nature, a nation of immigrants, that the kids often learn things before the parents did, the language or the latest knowledge, and we took that to excess. Excuse me for anybody who was involved in that, in um, the dot com boom of the 90s, where big companies that had been very successful for years turned, turned over huge new ventures to 23-year-olds with ponytails, purple hair, you know, the 
We, we all remember that. Um, and some of them were really good, I will say, but there was a lot that got lost in that process, and I wrote about that in an earlier book called, called Evolve, um, because there were mistakes made, because it wasn't married. The company suddenly said, here's something so new, none of us know anything about it, so they threw out what they did know things about, which may be how to make money in a business, not just collect money from the capital markets. You know, there were a lot of mistakes that were made in that era. Um, and so then we shifted. I saw many of those same companies not want anybody young anymore. They only wanted seasoned executives, and it's a little bit like Eric Schmidt coming into Google. Now that happens to be a great marriage, and I think that's the kind of marriage we need between people who have seen it all or seen a lot and people who are willing to challenge convention and have the latest knowledge. And if we can marry those, we have almost the perfect leadership structure. And I think with the boomers now becoming such a huge force, having 20 to 30 more productive years of life, and knowing that they once changed the world, I think they're going to do it again, and, um, and I think that they're going to insist on a different, a different kind of respect. And what we need is a, is a marriage of wisdom and fresh thinking. And I don't think all the fresh thinking necessarily comes from the young. And I don't think all the wisdom necessarily comes from people just because they've been doing something for a long period of time. We have not figured out how to value experience in America because we discard things. And I think easily we discard them. And we forget. You know, I have a, a, a great career out on the corporate circuit because the length of a managerial generation now is about three or four years. So then there's a whole new set of people, and I can come again and say the same thing I said, you know, three or four years ago. That's, that's a great business model. Um, so that is something that I think the sheer weight of the demographics will start to change. Well, you watch students go through Harvard, and now you're, it sounds like you're watching these managers go through these organizations you're going back to. Do you see any sort of trends over time in those student bodies? Well, I think that, um, do I see trends in the, in the, because, well, I see, I see people in the MBA program, and we've, and, and some of it is what we select for. Um, and one of my colleagues has just written a great book, Trashing Business Education, but he and I are very close colleagues, and, and we agree on this. I think in a lot of ways what, what has been taught to earlier generation of managers has not necessarily led businesses in the right direction, so we're trying to correct that. We now select for leadership and leadership potential um, and so we do get a different kind of person. And what I see is an enormous amount of, let me call it idealism, or concern about values and principles, and a desire at some point in life to create a social enterprise or a nonprofit that makes a big difference, but meanwhile I'll pay off my student loans and make a lot of money. I mean, the sense of values, and again, it may be our selection criteria, but the sense of values in this generation, I think, has been underreported, at least on the part of those who see themselves as leaders. And many now come for an MBA already, having not only started enterprises, mm -hmm. because in the dot-com boom you could do it when you were in college, and Facebook started that way and so forth even today, but they already have started nonprofits, and they've already been around the world doing service in Africa or Latin America. So do they push back when uh, you get up and, and lecture them? Well, I don't lecture them. Okay, so when you deal how with would them? I, you know, right. How would I dare? But, well, I mean, that's not our teaching method, which mm -hmm. is also one of these principles, finding common grounds, opening minds, etc. Mm -hmm. our, our teaching method is all discussion, mm -hmm. and I sort of have to sneak it in by indirection. But the answer is no, I don't have a problem um, um, personally because um, I'm established and they want to learn from me, and I think there is a lot of mutual respect as long as... I respect them. Mm -hmm. So these generational problems we talk about have to do with um, 
The same kind of polarizing thinking I talked about earlier with clashes of civilizations and dualistic thinking that, you know, the you, we talked about this before the program, that there are some organizations and generations saying, well, we're ready to do nothing and have leisure and let those young people work to pay our social security. That's how they view it. We're talking There's about a the little AARP. generational politics here. <laughs> This was a discussion I was having earlier about the AARP, which uh, in my view uh, is it's the most powerful lobby in Washington, and it is all about the obligations of the youth uh, to the old. And uh, my complaint to them is I think AARP should at least partly be about the obligations of the old to the young. Yeah, I mean, and we do have some generation, absolutely, and we do have some generational politics because there are communities that ban children, um, you know, senior grand resort living communities ban children. There are, there are um, places in which people won't vote for school levies because, you know, they don't have children. What do they care? So it's that same, though, kind of spirit of selfishness in the winter of our discontent where we're less generous and it's every person for themselves and we're everyone is a potential enemy that's what i want to get rid of if we can find that common ground and often it is through some physical service where people have come together to do something and they get to know each other okay last question this one from kevin kelly are some higher purposes higher than others <laughs> does, and does the particular purpose matter, or does it just have to be higher than an individual? Uh, you know, what if your higher purpose is to save souls? Um, go for it. I mean, I, um, does it have to be, are there some better than others? Um, the whole spirit of openness and, and, shall I dare say, liberalism that pervades the, what I've talked about, tolerance, inclusion, says that I'm, I can't prejudge purpose, um, one purpose is better than another. I do know, however, if that starts to intrude upon the rights of other people to express theirs, then I'd be concerned about it, but, but otherwise not. Um, we are, in America, our sense of purpose is often expressed religiously, it's also expressed secularly. And we are simultaneously, de Tocqueville said this about us, he said, we were the most materialistic and at the same time the most spiritual and devout. He said, we were the, so individualistic and yet we were communitarian. There's a lot of contradictions in a country like ours. Do I think some purposes are better than others? Um, well, you know, that's the voice of the people. People will, I don't want purpose, I, I mean there are certain values that we do say we should hold in common and I think respect and tolerance are that, but we need, a, we need dialogues about that. There are some people who don't believe that. There are some people who think that they should, they should exclude. Um, so what I really want is the process, the open mind process of learning of engaging with one another, of finding common ground where we have a task we want to accomplish together. And that tends to reduce the acrimony or the divisiveness of the ways where, that we may disagree. And I'm willing to have anybody's faith or vision subject to the marketplace of ideas as long as there's sufficient information and education that people can make informed choices. I wouldn't do that if it's demagoguery and no counter information. That's why I like the, a free press, such as its remnants are so much, and why I think the internet, for all that we say, there's misinformation and there's no editing process. But, you know, the wisdom of crowds does have a lot going for it in that sense being small d Democrats, and doing what Sam Palmisano did. I mean, I, I keep repeating that because it is so amazing to have over 300,000 people in a business where there's supposedly authority still be asked to weigh in and be given the opportunity to participate. And the technology will make it possible to let that 
marketplace of ideas survive. It'll also make it possible for small niche groups to survive at the same time that we find some common conversation we can all have. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.